You know, there's definitely a beauty of hunting your food and an importance in the ecosystem in how we leave it as our footprint. But the reward is when you go hunting, yes, you know, you're bringing home what we say sacred venison. Back in the day, venison was anything related to wild game. Well, today it's almost reserved solely for whitetails, elk, and moose. These are a great last meal of venison. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna braise it down and make it super tender and delicious. And this is actually gonna be one of our best whitetail meals of the week. We're hunting the creek and river bottoms here in Montana with overly outfitting. We're gonna work our way up the creek here and sort of peek through around the cottonwoods and see if we can find some bucks chasing does. Charles here says he's seen a couple of real good ones in the area. Yep. So it's time to get after them. With a lot of the focus being on big antlers, slick bow setups, who's doing a better job of managing their property for whitetails, etc., it's easy to lose sight of one of the greatest benefits of being whitetail hunters, venison. In this episode of Deer and Deer Hunting, Dan Schmidt explains his personal appreciation for the whitetail deer, while outdoor writer Brad Fenson brings us an outstanding venison recipe that is sure to impress everyone this coming season. You know, there's definitely a beauty of hunting your food and an importance in the ecosystem in how we leave it as our footprint. But the reward is when you go hunting, yes, you know, you're bringing home what we say sacred venison. You know, back in the day, venison was anything related to wild game. Well, today, it's almost reserved solely for whitetails, elk, and moose. But the reward is so much greater than that because the best way I like to parallel it is I'm a big vegetable gardener and there is something special about raising your own tomatoes and your own corn and your own potatoes because you're working that soil. That's what we say being grounded is. You're working that ground with your own hands. You're planting the seed, you're watching that seed grow, and then you're harvesting the crop. It's almost an identical situation with wild game and especially the white-tailed deer. There's something special and unique about going out into the woods and scouting, you know, and if you got your own ground, managing it and growing those deer. But if you even hunt public land like I did for almost 20 years, just going out there and acquiring your own food something extremely satisfying and rewarding, but also something very important in the larger scope of life. So the dietary importance of venison cannot be overemphasized. When you look at wild whitetails, if you compare that to domestic beef, now domestic beef is great, you know, it's what keeps this country run. But if you look at it compared to venison, venison is 40% fewer calories, over 200% fewer uh, grams of fat, and over 125% less cholesterol than beef. So if you're gonna compare venison to beef, lamb, pork, or chicken, it's not even close. More protein, less fat, less cholesterol, much healthier for you. Now that being said, you know, we herald the benefits of venison, but you also have to keep in mind that any red meat, including venison, is high in cholesterol. But the bigger picture there is that the LDL cholesterol in venison is much lower. The bad cholesterol is, it's the best meat you can eat. So let's just put it that way. So venison, extraordinarily healthy and good for you. And the best thing is, is it doesn't take anything but going out in the woods with your bow, your crossbow, or your gun to get some. Land of Whitetail is brought to you by This segment is brought to you by Outdoor Edge Knives and Tools. From field to freezer and everything in between.
You know, the next point that I'd like to make, I've heard since I was a little kid, in the fact that venison tastes different if deer are eating different things. I haven't seen that. I don't have that refined of a palate to tell the difference. I've eaten venison from the St. Lawrence Seaway. I've eaten venison from Eastern Oregon, from Texas, from Florida. I've eaten ven whitetail venison from all across the country. I cannot discern a difference. I know there are some people who not only claim, I believe they can tell the difference, but that's a refined palate. If you're looking at the way deer eat, what I've heard from people who say they can taste the difference is that the deer in the northern forests that might be eating more acorns, that might be eating more lichens, that woody matter, there's a more of a, a nuttier, bitter, I, I don't wanna say bitter, a more strong flavor to venison. I, again, I have not seen that as opposed to a farm-raised whitetail in the, in the Midwest farm belt, eating corn and soybeans and alfalfa and things like that. The biggest thing for venison flavor, in my opinion, and I think for most seasoned hunters, is how that venison is handled in the field, how is it brought into camp or you know out of the field, and how is it prepared. And there's a lot of things you have to keep in mind when doing that. So before I get into all the nuts and bolts on how to properly care for that venison so you get the best flavor, a lot of people say, well, they don't like venison because it tastes gamey. Well, let me begin and end that conversation right here. If you have tasted venison for the first time and you thought it tasted gamey, chances are it wasn't either processed properly or it wasn't trimmed out properly before it was served to you or may, might have not been cooked properly. But that gamey flavor does not come from the meat itself. The meat itself, if you take a pure piece of venison steak, fresh and processed properly, it's gonna be a mild flavor. Yes, it's gonna have more texture than beef, pork, chicken, or lamb because it's a wild animal. And that's how meat is supposed to taste. So it's really simple, right after the kill, you act quickly and decisively. Clean, cold, and to the processor, or if you're gonna process it yourself. So what I do right at the kill is I will, depending upon how far I have to take that animal, sometimes I will not field dress the deer right there in the field. If I have an opportunity where I can do it back at camp, that means I can process that deer without introducing extra dirt, extra pathogens in the field, especially if I have to drag the deer out. If I'm processing it in the field, I'm gonna field dress it quickly. I'm gonna get all the intestines, the blood, all the bloodshot, all the bad stuff out of the deer as cleanly as possible and transport it as cleanly as possible. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, depends on the weather. If it's cold out, I don't have to rush. Mother Nature's gonna help me with that. If it's not cold, if it's like today and it's nice and warm in the 70s, then I have to make sure that I get that either in a cooler quickly or get it on ice quickly or get it to a processor quickly. So that's the, the two things. Number one, clean. Number two, cold. I will wash out that inside of that carcass almost every single time. A science to that as well, because if you introduce water, you're gonna introduce the potential for spoilage because water and heat are not a good thing because that increases bacterial growth. So what I do there is I will rinse that deer out, I will pat it dry with paper towels, and I will get it cold as soon as possible. Sometimes that means packing the inside of that chest cavity with ice if I have to let it go overnight, or getting it into a walking cooler as quickly as possible, or if it's cold outside, just hanging it and let that body heat escape as quickly as possible. Now that we've covered the correct steps for proper care of your wild game, it's time to heat that Dutch oven up. Coming up next, we take you to the river bottoms of the Big Sky State to join Brad Fenson on his pursuit of a Montana buck. After that, Brad has a delicious venison recipe that will leave the whole deer camp drooling for a second helping. Well, here we are in Montana, Sweetgrass Creek, Sweetgrass Creek, down in the Cottonwoods. We've seen a pile of deer today. We're setting up for a little old-fashioned deer drive. 
We expect a bunch of deer to come through here in front of us, but one never knows they could come through behind us. So we're kind of watching in every direction. All right, well, we've been hunting the creek bottoms here and the big cottonwoods. I'm surprised how open it is. You know, those deer just sort of zip in and out, but they've really been chasing the does out into this open grassland. And I don't know if it's as much they're chasing them as the does are coming out and bedding here, trying to get just a break from the bucks. We watched this one doe come out and bed in the edge of the field and stay there. And then this buck came and challenged another buck that was bedded on the fence line watching her. And it was uh, quite a rutting show. Lots of fun, lots of action. But they're certainly going, rutting hard, fighting, chasing does, all the things you want to see when you're whitetail hunting. We know most people think of Montana as elk and mule deer country, but I'm telling you, we have seen hundreds of whitetails in the last two days. It, uh, and it's a show. It's not just a hunt, it's a real show. So I'm pleased to get my first Montana whitetail. He's a brute. Hello, today we're going to bring you some whitetail bits and pieces. We're here in deer camp in Montana hunting with Overly Outfitting and we had a beautiful young whitetail doe that we've used as camp meat. And of course we've eaten all the prime cuts, the back straps, the tenderloins, the nice steaks and all the rest of it. And what we have left is a bunch of shanks and there's some front shoulders and even the blades. And people often don't know what to do with these, they cut them up, they grind them. Unfortunately a lot of shanks I think actually get just, you know, just tossed out. But these are a great last meal of venison. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna braise it down and make it super tender and delicious. And this is actually gonna be one of our best white tail meals of the week. The acid in the tomatoes really works well to help break all of this down. And it will fit, we're just gonna have to stir it around a little bit. Some fresh rosemary always goes well, but we're in deer camp, so we have dried rosemary. All right, we got the stove fired up. There is our Dutch oven. Look at that. We're gonna bring it up to a simmer and then just turn it down and let it start to cook real low and slow for the afternoon while we're out finding another big buck.
Land of Whitetail is brought to you by Okay, we want to shoot a doe today. What are we going to do? Well, you know, I love bow hunting. I love gun hunting. And yes, I love crossbow hunting. You know, crossbow hunting for me is so enjoyable because it's so versatile. Now, yes, early season with my Matthews, I love to shoot does. I love to shoot does with, during shotgun season, during rifle season, even during muzzleloader season. But lately, the crossbow has been so versatile for me in the fact that I can shoot early season, mid season, and especially late season. One thing that I think people overlook is that there's a lot of special antlerless seasons that you can't use a gun. You might be shooting in a suburban area. Yes, you could bring a bow, but if you're really out there to make meat and put meat in the freezer, the crossbow is so versatile and it's very efficient. I can fill more than one tag, very silent operating, super accurate and another thing a nice bonus yes i'm a seasoned hunter a lot of you are seasoned hunters but for a non-seasoned hunter if you want to take advantage of those extra antlerless seasons you might have not shot a bow in a long time or maybe never it's going to be real hard to come up to speed with regular archery with a crossbow a little bit of training maybe in a weekend you're going to be Man. proficient another thing i like to mention about the crossbow is these crossbows they have today very lightweight very compact makes it especially helpful when you're hunting in a ground blind situation a ladder stand doesn't really matter it, those long heavy crossbows of yesteryear are a thing of the past nice and compact super fast I can shoot longer distances 50 60 yards not even a problem with these modern crossbows especially the nice compactness ground blinds perfect for those suburban hunts. Take that crossbow out, fill some tags, and put some prime venison in your freezer. I keep these in my backpack always because I sweat a lot, as you can probably tell. And whether I'm wiping my head off or my gear. Now, has this ever happened to you? Have you ever been shooting, let's say you're out doe hunting and you want to shoot more than one deer? You shoot an arrow, deer comes up, smells the arrow and takes off and is alarmed. You think it's from the blood. It's not from the blood, it's from your hands. You touch that arrow, you got your human scent all over it. So before I get in a tree stand, before I wipe my head, especially the arrow I'm hunting with, I just wipe it down, get it back in that quiver, and I'm ready to hunt. I also will do things like my release, my hands, especially on a warm day like today, wet wipes. They've got a lot of uses. <laughs>